So, welcome back to Silmarillion Total War and to another battle replay. This one is going to be something we haven't seen on the channel in general, not just in Silmarillion for quite a while. It's going to be a simple 1v1. There are a couple of reasons for this. One is because we haven't seen one in quite a while, and the other is because my recording schedule is going to be a little bit tight this week, so I'm having to do things midweek, so there are only so many hours in the day, so I wanted to select at least one replay that was a little bit shorter. I have already finished recording uh, a fairly lengthy siege just earlier today, so uh, there's not many hours left before it's time to go to sleep. Um, but yeah, we're going to be seeing Finarfin take on Gondolin. Another reason to see this one as well is that this is the first time we've seen Finarfin since the finalised version of Silmarillion came into being, at least from a mechanical perspective. I think this is a map we have seen before, but the map does shrink when there are less players on it, so there's less room to move around on. Um, but yeah, plenty of undergrowth, and it's going to be two factions who are very comfortable, really, when it comes to facing one another in a fronting up, orthodox style of engagement with the quality of Gondolin and then the defensive resilience of Finarfin. It's going to be a battle of quality, to be sure. We'll start off as well with the player who we're going to be seeing this from the perspective of. Didn't send it to me, but this is one of those uh, replays that uh, I've just lifted stra straight from the Silmarillion Discord, really, as many of them have been in the past, though I have started to get sent a few directly as well. Gondolin, man. Gondolin's front line. We have the shield bearers of the tower in and amongst the guardsmen of the heart. We have seen Gondolin a couple of times recently, and in those battles we haven't actually seen the shield bearers of the tower, which is a bit of a shame because they have a unique spear animation which makes them not quite as effective when it comes to fighting in formation and keeping people at bay as pikes are, but because of their very fast attack animation and just in general their ability to keep units at bay to an extent, they represent really a good alternative to that kind of unit. And considering the relative lack of phalanx units that Silmarillion has to offer, it does give Gondolin a nice option on the front line as well when it comes to soaking up punishment, which is going to be important against Finarfin because that's an area in which they are particularly strong. So Gondolin do need to front up to that in some way if they want to win this in the conventional manner to which they are accustomed. Guardsmen of the Harp we have seen recently, the most straightforward unit of line infantry that Gondolin have, and one of the few units for Gondolin as well that you can mass in more extreme numbers. Many of their units are capped at lower levels. Marksman of the Heavenly Arch, both sides on display today have access to heavier archers which are quite at home when it comes to skirmishing, which again is not a given in Silmarillion. Many of the factions are not really suited for shooting one another at long range with archers, um, but both factions today will be. Marksman of the Heavenly Arch, one of the best in that regard as well. They don't have anything too special about them at range, which is a little bit different when it comes to Finarfin. Um, when it comes to the pure conventionality of their heavy armour, um, they are very good when it comes to trading fire with the opposition. Not terribly surprised to see these guys either in the recent siege we saw in the ruins. Uh, they may have ended up on the losing side on that occasion, but the armourers of the Hammers of Wrath uh, very much find themselves at home when it comes to dealing with enemy armoured units, which Finarfin, when it comes to their higher end, um, and the core, really, of their effective defence. Uh, you would imagine that the armourers should be very good at dealing with them, as well as taking a decent amount of punishment as well with their shields and thick armour. Uh, same on the other side as well, more marksmen, more armourers, so a conventional formation there. Bringing two catapults is fairly expensive and pretty risky. It will force Finarfin maybe into moving around, which is not necessarily what they're best at doing, mobility and all of that. But it does mean that if the catapults are closed in on and Finarfin have superior infantry numbers, Gondolin are going to be dependent on some trickery to get themselves out of a bit of a hole. So we'll see if these catapults can do the business. They are manned by a capable infantry unit in the Axemen at the Gate of Bronze, but they do still need the artillery pieces themselves to do a little bit of the work when it comes to paying off the large expense for artillery pieces. Uh, perhaps we'll see what Finarfin have brought because they have a very similar unit mechanically to this but this could be the single most dangerous unit of infantry on the field the Lords of the Golden Flower big damage off of these elven curved blades and also very very high stats and hit points just in general but they are a small unit of course so they have to be the centerpiece of an army not capable of soloing an entire enemy force especially not when that enemy force has the quality to at least match Gondolin in many places. Scouts of the Tree, again slingers, good amounts of damage, it depends 
on what sort of position they can take up and for how long they can shoot. They do have armor piercing attacks in melee with their clubs as well, I believe, um, which does give them a little bit of extra utility. They're not the easiest foes to bring down in melee with just anything, um, but they will be hoping to get as many of those shots off as possible. Another unit of the armorers here way out the back. And finally, we have the Knights of the Golden Flower, a very effective unit of Lance Cavalry. The one time we saw them recently on another open field map, um, they were swamped really by the monsters from Nandan Gorthev, but considering the leaner nature of cavalry um, between both of these two factions really, um, they will be hoping to find a little bit more room on the field today and getting those lances down where it hurts with the Finarfin army. But let's have a look at what we can see of Finarfin anyway, because I'm sure that some of their army will be concealed within these trees, though hopefully not too much of it, so we can at least take stock of Alexios 22's frontline force. And it's kind of similar over here in the sense that you've got a supporting unit, albeit uh, the Guardsmen of the Half are very conventional on the other side, whereas the Swordsmen of Talath Dirnin have access to some javelins to help even things up and do a little bit of damage before proceedings get underway. And they will be backed up by the Bridge Wards of Nargothrond, one of the very few dedicated pike-specific units. Uh, many of the Phalanx units, obviously I've already mentioned that, Phalanx units in Silmarillion are fairly few and far between. Pikes even more so. Off the top of my head there are still only three of them. Um, and the Finarfin ones are arguably the best. Um, again, they have maybe a little bit more finesse than the Nalgrim offering. Um, the Nalgrim being a little bit more plodding perhaps, but with the extra defensive uh, leverage that the, the armour gives them. Elven Pikes of course, uh, well known for dealing a little bit more damage perhaps, although I'm not sure that's true in Silmarillion. Either way, it's not really that important. When it comes to a conventional frontline fight, if it does get bogged down, um, even the shield bearers over on Gondolin's side will not be able to do much against the extreme range that the bridge wards do enjoy. Wardens of Nargothrond, a detachment unit of these guys, very, very good general spears. Elite as well. They will need to concern themselves with units like the armorers on the other side, because as much as they are good defensively, those hammers will crack through a good amount of that defense given by their armor, but we'll have to wait and see how the engagement goes there. A single catapult ma um, manned by the shield bearers of Ladros. So you can tell just from their weaponry that you, these guys, I'm sure, are armor piercing given the hammers that they wield. But similar to the Axemen of the Gate of Bronze, they can uh, do the business in melee if called upon, but you really do need the artillery to do at least some lifting before that proves to be the case. Just in behind we've got some defenders of Talath Dyn, and these guys javelin spear hybrids, unlike the swordsmen, are going to be defending the flanks as well. Finarfin in general do indulge a little bit more in Silmarillion's love of the javelin unit, and that will be to their benefit here against the Gondolin quality. Company of Brunsk Gwyndor, I don't think the enhanced charge bonus is going to be too significant on the field today, but we'll see. The Arqueni Morma Gilwa are the similar unit of quality to the Lords of the Golden Flower on the other side. The Lords are the better unit individually, but the Arqueni there are nearly double in the units, and ultimately they're both very strong elven two-handed swordsmen, so we shall see how they get on in their face-off today. We've got some more Wardens of Nargothrond in a detachment on the flank as well. A little bit further back, we've got some marks with Nargothrond. I believe they still have their specialty projectile, which will give them a little bit more attacking punch against Gondolin. Whether that will be enough to make the difference in the skirmishing, that remains to be seen. The catapults may have more to say about that than anything, though. The rest of the Finarfin army surely is hidden as well. So I guess without further ado, let's get this show on the road. I mean, just the fact that there is one catapult facing off against two suggests that the artillery fight is probably going to be won by Gondolin, and Gondolin's thinking, I quite like the idea of bringing two catapults actually. Finarfin clearly would have been hoping to at least level the artillery playing field and then be able to utilize their pikes as Gondolin marched towards them, but that's not necessarily going to be the case anymore. You know, for the infantry front lines actually trying to do damage to them first and foremost, but with limited hits being scored there and considering the sheer amount of projectiles being sent forth you would imagine that the artillery war is going to be won by Gondolin. Of course, single shot kills still very much the order of the day in Silmarillion, so artillery's focusing down artillery, probably still the thing that you're going to see more of. Getting into looser formation than they were, but still not exactly scoring tons and tons of kills. Everything else getting into loose formation, I mean. 
the artillery, and the artillery is getting crumbled pretty quickly. I mean, you can tell here that Alexios is going to lose the artillery duel badly. Even if Alexios had decided to engage in that face-off, he wouldn't really have fared much better. But you may have at least blunted Gondolin's ability to use their artillery, and ultimately not enough of the ammunition has been used up to the point where Benarfin can afford to sit back and safely take the damage that is heading their way. They are going to need to do something, um, and they may be forced onto the attack. I think this is the Lords of the Golden Flower indeed, or Knights of the Golden Flower I should say, that are potentially going to try and take the long route around, but Anthan will be very pleased with how the initial phases of this battle have gone, Marks of Nargothrond peeling off to the side. Nexios, of course, who recently, the most we've seen of him has been in the ongoing Reforged tournament, and been doing very well also, but it's not the best of starts for him here. Interestingly enough, ever since the catapult was reduced to only one artillery piece, they've been doing a little bit better for themselves. Again, falling just short. <coughs> Excuse me. Ooh, going for the big prizes now, and only just missing the Lords of the Golden Flower, denying well any good hit on these guys. There's a lot of value gained very, very quickly. But it's a more difficult shot to make. Oh, but they have made it. Even only three of them falling by the wayside is a big deal. So far, both sides still content to simply trade blows from afar. Artillery, even in modern warfare, is the uh, the go-to, after all. But now the infantry starting to move forward. One of the artillery pieces may be using all of its ammunition up, and now the Axemen will have to do their part in melee. A bit worrying if that's the case, actually, from a Gondolin perspective, or maybe it is merely a ruse. They need to be doing a little bit more damage at longer ranges, I think, otherwise as they move in, that will give the edge to the Finarfin Javelin Corps. Bridge Wards as well, definitely not the sort of thing that... Gondolin will be wanting to leave unchecked, though from a Finarfin perspective they'll definitely fear the Armourers. Big amounts of damage coming their way, and not a huge amount of options when it comes to damage dealing for Finarfin to fall back on, unless they are free to use... Ooh, hello. That's the Golden Flower flanking around, I mean, defenders of Talaf Dirnin, utilising themselves as a defensive shield while the Marksmen of Nargothron start shooting at the Knights. No cavalry presence for Finarfin means that they are going to have to engage in this. Essentially a game of whack-a-mole with the Knights of, Gold of the Golden Flower and trying to keep them at bay. Both sides still manoeuvring for advantage. Neither side wants to begin the melee engagement on the back foot, because if they do, Gondolin will end up trapped on the front line against javelins and pikes, or Finarfin will end up having their flanks overrun by units of extremely dangerous and armour-piercing infantry. Neither side can afford too much of that. Marks of the Heavenly Arch going to start testing the front line, which will be enough to convince Finarfin to move forward, but it will also stretch their army quite a lot. The marksmen and defenders of Talaf Dirnin will be quite a long way away still marshalling against the presence of the Gondolin cavalry. The swordsmen, they will be hoping that they can at least get one javelin volley off, but Gondolin have judged this quite well. They've moved their archers in to do the damage, and ultimately the javelins will get some shots off, but not to the extent, not to the not with the clear sight line that they would have been hoping for. The guardsmen of the harp and shield bearers of the tower getting into place, and so the all-important line engagement begins. An environment where both sides are at home, as we've said. Arquani and Mormagil are getting targeted by the scouts of the tree, and it's far better to commit your units into melee rather than allowing them to simply wither on the vine. Catapult crewmen, the action of the Gate of Bronze getting involved here. Both catapult crewmen facing off against one another, actually. Shield bearers of Ladros may be a little bit more of a threatening unit just because of their weaponry, but numbers are still in favour. See in the distance there, the Knights of the Golden Flower will keep one eye on that, but the Marks of the Heavenly Arch dictating the early pace, and then the Slings also helping out. Gondolin's initial line will struggle against the 
catapults. Not catapults, the infantry or uh, the phalanx, I should say. Bridge wards, and then the Arquani Mormagilwa here in the middle as well. I mean, Gondolin do have reserve lines they can bring up where Finarfin kind of don't, but this is only really useful if you have the numbers to actually make those reserves relevant. The armourers will, or should, crush this understrength unit of Horns of Nargothrond under their heels. But, some reinforcements, the scouts of Tora and Faroth, a unit of lighter archers revealing themselves, one of the units that Finarfin had in reserve skulking around in the trees. And while there went the Knights of the Golden Flower routing off very, very quickly, and that clearly a result of the damage from the javelins coming in. They did manage to land a charge on the marksman, but definitely not worthwhile a trade. Should bear as the tower struggling. They're going to need more warm bodies on the front line here, Gondolin, if they hope to be successful. I think their skirmishers had the better of it early on, but that's becoming far more of a contested thing now that the marksman with their split shots are having their say. Fnarfin starting to spread their wings a little bit as well. So they won't be committing reinforcements to the front line as such, Fnarfin. But they will be trying to use their what little reserves they have to flank around and put extra pressure on Gondolin. Some of these exposed units of bridge wards not doing quite so well, where Gondolin are able to condense their forces and crack through the phalanx in places. Just in behind Marksman. Still going about their business. Heavier units of archers. Always going to be a potential problem. These are Axemen struggling on the flanks as well. So Fenarfin will still be happy. We'll see if those ca um, cavalrymen return. If they do, then the surprise hammer and anvil strike Alexios suffers could be fairly deadly. More reserves coming forward from Gondolin now, and again, the all power, the all conquering armourers of the hammer. I say that though, but these defenders of Talith did in so far, and at House of Finarfin using their javelins to good effect. More conflict happening on the flanks again, more of the lightfoot units trying to win out over here. Scouts of the tree chasing off the scouts of Tor and Faroth, and I think actually the cavalry has returned because you can see it arriving in the distance, and they will connect nicely with the marksmen of Nargothrond. Far safer bet when it comes to charging these guys than it is to charge into the defenders of Talath Dianin, but will the knights last too much longer under attentions like that? I don't think so. I have to say they certainly haven't paid for themselves, and the catapult crew arguably hasn't either, and these are expensive high ticket units. For Narfin, depending on units like pikes and javelins may end up being the winning ticket here, but there's still plenty of time left in this battle to go, relatively speaking. Armourers in business. Marks of the Heavenly Arch, of course, can certainly contribute in melee as well. Their defensive prowess twinned with their two-handed sword, giving them a bit of an edge in melee, and defenders of Talath Dianin won't relish the chance to face them. Go. Still some pressure being put on in the back lines as well. Knights of the Golden Flower ever dwindling. The company of Prince Gwyndor now also being committed. Maybe a little bit more of a dependable sword and board unit. Dedicated after all, but lacking that javelin that the standard swordsmen of Talath Dirnin do possess. To give the knights their credit, in spite of the fact they've had a rough ride of it against projectiles and spears in this battle, they have at least stayed active up until this point. Arquani peeling themselves off the front line. Interesting, really, considering the fact that they're the only unit that can go toe-to-toe, mano y mano with the Lords of the Golden Flower, but Javelin's hoping to do their thing. Some of the units becoming shaken. It's going to be a question of staying power for Finarfin, which usually they're very, very good at, but they're having to stand and face one of the more dangerous forces that Silmarillion has when it comes to a more straight-up engagement, such as the one we're seeing here. Company of Prince Gwyndor. Doing a decent enough job, but they're going to find themselves overmatched. After a certain period of time, Wards of Nargothron doing their thing. Marksmen as well, but since the arrival of the Marksmen and the final 
significant commitment of reinforcements. The catapult crew and the scouts are truly really the last unit's gondola and help that they can commit to a position. But the overall quality, I think, is in Gondolin's favour here. The decision to hold something back is paying dividends here, and maybe the lack of overall damage dealing capacity for Finarfin is hurting them a little bit here. They do often rely on outlasting the enemy, but that only works if they can keep the enemy at arm's length and if they can depend on, or, or if they can depend on, a significant quality gap. But that's certainly not the case here, both sides evenly poised. Maybe not enough of these Wardens of Nargothrond in the main line to withstand the brutality of Gondolin's attack. The Axemen of the Gate bronze. The second unit of them, the first, perished. In pretty short order, actually, against the Finarfin equivalents, but this flanking force, having the numbers advantage, they will certainly fancy their chances here. Further back, armourers. Scouts of the tree. Also still in reserve. To be fair, Marks were having the arch starting to suffer a little bit, and that can be attributed to the supporting shots from a depleted unit of Marks on Nargothron, but it's enough. There goes the FNAF in general, though. Even the elves will feel that. Now, Quenny Norma Gilwa. May not be facing off against the Lords of the Golden Flower, but still having to deal with the heavy hits of the armourers, and that was enough for their general to fall by the wayside. Albeit the Arquani, in combination with the company of Prince Gwyndor, doing a decent job in this little corner of the battlefield, but now the Lords of the Golden Flower taking a few losses at the hands of that thin half in front line, but Gondolin more and more looking like they're in the ascendancy here. Is evenly matched. Defeat almost a certainty. The Finarfin at this point really don't have the damage dealing capacity to see themselves over the line. I think it would take a numbers collapse of some description from Gondolin with some defenders of Talath Dearlin arriving on the flank. I mean, decent numbers of units with a hundred. These are the sort of margins that can make a difference, considering neither side is exactly blessed with limitless numbers. They're both certainly the sort that will dip into quality more often than not. I think Prince Gondor taking some friendly fire hits, really, but this is the biggest concentration of Gondolin forces, and it also includes the most dangerous singular unit that they have. Shots coming in from the other split-shot projectiles as well. Marks on the Heavenly Arch shaken on the flank. Fans of Talath Dearnay doing a decent job, fighting them pretty much to a standstill. The Wounds of Nargothrond offering their particular brand of damage as well with their spears. Going after the Scouts of the Tree, far more likely to result in kills, and also you can't really let them be considering the fact they're going to be firing sling ammunition at point blank, so Fenarf in doing their best to try and deal with the Gondolin infantry as and where they can. Over here, Armourers of the Hammer of Wrath. I'm going to be calling them Hammers, plural, of Wrath for the last couple of battles, which again, a mistake. These Wardens of Nargothron, despite being detachments again, showcasing how good they are. They can keep themselves alive, but they can also dish out that damage. Beauty of being elven spears, I guess. But they are going to struggle still against the sheer numbers that are crashing against them here. Defenders of Talath Dearnin need to help hold, need to help them hold the flank, but the Talath Dearnin units are the first instance of where the loss of the general is likely going to start to bite. It is interesting because really the cavalry from Gondolin and the catapults, two of the most expensive elements of the army, didn't really do a whole lot, but you could argue the catapults by their mere presence and the cavalry, actually, not really through kills, made it so that Finarfin couldn't really move in the way that they wanted. And when it comes to a force which is designed 
around dictating position and outlasting the opposition as much as FNAF is, maybe that is enough to make the difference and enough to state that they were a worthwhile addition. Though I think the heart and soul of this army has been the armourers because of the quality and the damage that it offers, which is something Finarfin simply haven't had outside of their ranged units. And the Javelin units, like these defenders, they did a good number on the cavalry, but they haven't really been able to have the same impact on Gondolin's infantry. And the Marks of Nargothron have had an impact late on, but by that point maybe there isn't enough of them to get the necessary DPS out onto the field. I mean, Finarfin are living up to their defensive nature, however. If this had been a lesser faction, they would have started to crumble in the face of the Gondolin quality, but the level of defensive ability Finarfin have, buying as much time as possible for units like the Marksmen to at least try and turn this battle on its head still. Projectiles ripping in. The Arquenny, not many of them left now, only 14 of them. But in all fairness, they and the Lords of the Golden Flower showing a similar level of disrepair at this point. As the cries of anguish ring out. Scouts the tree getting into place to reload. They quietly had a decent influence on this battle as well. Now the battle becoming stretched out. I mean, in all fairness, these wardens are actually winning their little engagement. There's still a few bridge wards among their number as well, and marks with Margothrond also. As a matter of fact, between them, the defenders of Talath Din, and then the marksmen, they are actually going to win over on this flank, and they may as well put all their eggs into this basket, I think, at this point. In fact, they're winning on this flank to such an extent that Finarfin may yet do their chances here, especially if those split shot projectiles can continue to do the business. Assisting with the marksmen of the Heavenly Arch. Much as they are decent in melee, the defenders have tarred in and have shown their defensive chops here, but surely with more reinforcements this is the moment where they creak and buckle. I think we have seen the strengths of both sides here. Arguably the weaknesses as well, because with a more numerous army, I think Gondolin would have actually been able to surround and more efficiently destroy Finarfin. Because, I mean, they certainly don't lack for quality, so that isn't the issue. And often maybe lacking the damage-dealing credentials to really bite in against Gondolin now with melee, but their defensive capabilities have certainly been showcased here, and it may yet be enough for them to win out. Scouts the tree doing their thing here. I mean, the Marksman of Nargothrond later on have certainly proven their worth as well. Slings bouncing off the armour, armourers of the hammer, peeling themselves off the remaining Finarf and infantry. I think they realise, Gondolin, that if they can disable these marksmen of Nargothrond, it doesn't give Finarf in that many options when it comes to continuing their fight back. Hammers of Wrath. Surely going to be laid low now. The additional reinforcements of the other Nargothrond units arrives. They just need to do really what Finarfin have been doing successfully for the final half of the battle, really, though, and that's just hold out against this force on the flank for Finarfin and wait for the ranged units to do a bit of extra damage and for their infantry to pull out some victories elsewhere on the battlefield. Good attempted fight back this though from Finarfin, given the fact that if you look purely at the army compositions early on, I did like the look of Gondolin's composition more than Finarfin's. Gondolin have a more varied roster anyway, so they do have more options when it comes to trying to make the correct selections, but I think Panthan has done that here. And the armourers. He's going to crack in against that Finarfin armour. So the tree continuing to do their thing as well. They do damage at a slower pace, of course, but they've been getting consistent shots. Yeah, the announcer fancies their chances, and so do I. Still got the 
quality of the infantry up here, but still refusing to die completely are these Wardens of Nargothron. Maybe the maybe the true MVPs of both sides, really, because without a unit with these credentials, I don't think Finarfin would have done as well as they have, even in defeat here in this battle. Gondolin General likely going to be able to survive to the end as well. Finally the Warden's Break. Two Marks of the Heavenly Arch still live from the other unit. Again, at this point I'm trying to accept the damage but I mean it's not as if they have much of a choice at this point for Narfin though. The battle is now beyond them. There isn't really anything they can do to reverse their fate as much as they tried in the midsection. They have done differently. Maybe the double artillery pick was the right call for them, to be honest. But I think their javelins really got in that initial engagement. I think Gondolin did a good job of closing up to units like the swordsmen. Ultimately, not enough javelins found their mark before the melee engagement got underway, and that was one way in which they could have equalised the damage dealing potential between both front lines. As the extra units now arrive. Is it going to be a morale collapse or an admission of defeat from Alexios? Marksman starting to open up again as well. Seven percent. For a, you know, for a one v one on an open field, sometimes those can turn into real landslides. So it has proven to be a close run thing indeed. I'm glad I just decided to show this one. And there we have it. And fair play. A 1v1, I think composition plays a big part in a 1v1, and like I said, I like to look of the Gondolin army a little bit more. It can be a bit rock, paper, scissors-esque, where on occasion bringing two artillery pieces is not going to be the call to make because the enemy may have intended to be aggressive all along. And if that's the case, the catapults aren't really going to have the time to do the business that you want them to. Um, but with Finarfin, there is a certain certain knowledge that they're going to be more defensive in nature, they're going to try and use their phalanx, they're going to try and use their very strong defensive units um, and I think that's what Alexios was maybe intending to do, at least trade back and forth a little bit early on then creep forward with the javelins and force an engagement that way and then maybe they would have been able to outlast Gondolin, but it didn't really work out that way and unfortunately, given the composition he had he didn't really have much of a plan B he could have done, I think the you know, wheeling around the flank with the flanks with the marks from Nargothron, and using their split shots in the way he did was, you know, a good improvised plan B. Um, but in the end, given the damage the archers took earlier in the battle, um, it wasn't enough for him to fully fight his way back in. But it was a good attempt nonetheless, and a good battle indeed. Let's see what did the damage for Gondolin. Shieldbearers of the Tower were a decent front line. Ultimately, that first front line was more of a sacrificial one, and the second line were the true damage dealers. Although in the end, the Shieldbearers and the Guardsmen of the Harp ended up getting more kills than the Armourers. I think the Armourers, um, you know, the hefty blows that they rained down were important. Guardsmen of the Harp 151 as well. Knights of the Golden Flower could have been an expensive mistake, but again, I think just them, the mere fact they were there meant that some of the Javelins and some of the Archers that could have been helping the front line right when the engagement started, they were ultimately too far away, and Gondolin ultimately reaped the rewards of that as well. Whether that's enough to justify spending the amount of, that the Knights of the Golden Flower cost you is another matter, but they did end up doing, um, getting some value in a way that wasn't just outright kills. Um, it was actually the Marks from the Heavenly Arch that ended up with the most kills in the long run. Good at range and decent in melee as well. So yeah, big thank you to the Silmarillion Discord for allowing me to show these, and big thank you to Panthan and Alexios as well for uh, posting this battle up in the Replays channel on the Silmarillion Discord and allowing me to show it. Um, and yeah, it's been a while since we've seen a 1v1, and I'm glad that that's the first one that we've seen in a little while, because that was a good quality one indeed. Um, more conventional perhaps than many 1v1s can be, especially in Silmarillion, given the propensity of javelins and hidden units and factions whose entire identity is based around hit and run and guerrilla warfare. This was much more of a straight up battle between two more powerhouse style factions, and it was nice to see actually. So yeah, big thank you to them. As for what's going to be coming up soon, as I mentioned, I did record a siege earlier on today, which I think will be coming out this Saturday, but um, you'll have to wait and see what that one is. And moving further forwards, 
it's a little bit greyer because um, there's a few things going on. Obviously, there's still the uh, the closing stages of the Reforged tournament, which I hope to still be able to show because again, semi-final stages and other things in the pipeline. Again, are the sort of things which I, I won't put too much of a time frame on, but there are bits and pieces moving behind the scenes um, with regards to show pieces. I think that are not just the tournament. Um, when it comes to a reforged perspective, obviously still ongoing Silmarillion and stuff, um, potentially a few Last Alliance things mixed in there as well, and plans for further afield um, still in the initial stages. But I'll stop waffling now. Big thank you um, to all the players involved once again. Hope you enjoyed this, and hope you'll join me for whatever is next.